2 Peter chapter 2. And we'll be looking at the first 11 verses uh, together this morning. Uh, Chapter 2 is really dealing with uh, false teachers, and so we're going to break this into two sections. Uh, The title of our study this morning is, Don't Be Seduced by Greed and Charm. As I was trying to think of a, a catchy or a clever introduction for this chapter, uh, I couldn't come up with anything. And then as I was scanning the news, I saw, hey, there's a headline that kind of ties in directly to what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. And um, maybe you've heard about another TV evangelist <laughs> who's asking money for a private jet, uh, something like around $40 million dollars. Uh, because you can't fly coach, right? I'm too important, too busy. There's weird people on there. And uh, I've, got, I've got so much I need to do, right? My schedule is important. God forbid I should stop and minister to someone on coach who could actually use some help, right? Um, and so seriously, they're asking for that much money. And, and this has happened before. I think it was last year there was another gentleman who asked for it. And he got it. People gave him millions of dollars. And now this guy's seeing, well, if he got it. I want my jet too. (laughs) So people are giving money to these these kind of people. And you think, why? How could this happen? And then you start thinking, who are these people? And and how do we make sure that we recognize what they're doing? And how do we safeguard to stay away from them? And that was really Peter's heart. Because remember, he knew his time was coming to an end. And he knew after I leave... As Jesus said, and even Paul said, savage wolves will come in and begin to destroy the church. There will be false teachers that will rise up and lead people astray from the centrality of Christ. You would think that people would know that a Christian is a Christ follower. But you go around and people say, well, I'm an American, therefore I must be a Christian. Well, it doesn't work that way. I go to church, therefore I must be a Christian. doesn't work that way. All right? John chapter 3, you must be born again. You must be a Christ follower. You, you, you got to let him dwell in your heart and then help him help you live out this Christian walk, uh, this Christian faith. And so Peter's going to be talking about that. And the first three verses, we'll, we'll see he tells us how to spot and resist a false teacher. He'll describe them for us. Verses 4 through 5 is the beginning of three examples. The first example we'll see is Noah escaping the flood. Uh, The second is in verses 6 through 8, the example of Lot fleeing from Sodom. And the lastly, verses 9 through 11, the example of the godly rescued today. We'll see there's direct application from the Old Testament to our lives today. I know there are some uh, who stay away from the Old Testament. Apparently, Peter didn't. And I think that's an example for us that we should read the Old Testament too. Right? We don't want to stay away from that. And so... A lot here, again, the context dealing with these people who would come in and lead people astray from Jesus. And any good parent doesn't want to see their kids lied to, right? You don't want to hear your kids coming home from school, Mom and Dad, I learned today we came from fish and monkeys. We evolved. And you're thinking, okay, we've got some work here, right? And that's Peter's heart. He wants to make sure that that they're going to be strong in the Lord. So 2 Peter chapter 2 Picking up in verse 1, we read, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. When I read this, I see this is not a pretty picture. Uh, And when you read the letter of Jude as well, you see he uses very similar language. It's a very vivid language describing these false teachers. These false prophets who are teaching these destructive heresies. And he mentions that here uh, in verse 1, that they secretly bring in these destructive heresies. They don't do it 
right? They're not going through the gate. They're, they're climbing in over. They're going through the back door. It's secretive. And they're bringing in these heresies. And the word heresy here means a sect or a party that is outside of traditional doctrine. For us, that would be like a church member saying to another church member, are you on my side or on the pastor's side? Or maybe everyone else is wrong and I'm right. Uh, they could even say the Bible is wrong and I'm right. You begin to realize, okay, something's not adding up here. Um, uh, and a false teacher is really promoting heresy and causing division. They're forcing you to make a choice between their doctrines and that of the true Christian faith, which a good pastor should be teaching, right, through the Bible, teaching the, the Christian faith as well and not being led astray. It uh, shouldn't be, are you on my side or the pastor's side? It should be, are you on God's side? <laughs> and so there are those who seek to cause divisions, um, lead us astray from Christ. And the false teachers are, are really better known for what they deny than what they affirm. Here in verse 1, we see they are also denying the Lord. And with that, they're essentially denying the inspiration of the Bible. They're denying the sinfulness of man, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That salvation is by faith alone, through God's grace alone. They even deny the reality of an eternal judgment, that there is a hell. And that people who reject Christ are going to end up separated from him. So, here we see that they are especially denying the deity of Jesus Christ. They know that they can do away with Jesus being God, that he was just a, an elevated man who had a godlike status, that then it forces them to start reinterpreting Scripture and saying, well, we can become godlike. We can begin to control the weather. We can begin to rebuke the weather and it will listen to us. And we can begin to have this elevated spiritual status where we're like God. And uh, it's crazy, but there's many of them that do that. And we see here that uh, in verse 2 that they have destructive ways. Um, and it's interesting, and I looked this up in the Greek, uh, it could also be translated promiscuous conduct. Their ways are promiscuous, they're destructive um, their conduct is not Christ-like. Outwardly, maybe it looks like, but secretly behind closed doors, nope, they're doing things that aren't honoring the Lord. And it's these people who want to satisfy their own lust, and they do it under the guise of religion. Uh, and there were false prophets in the Old Testament as well, in Jeremiah's day. Um, if you read Jeremiah chapter 23, uh, verses 14 and 32, you'll see that Jeremiah had to deal with that. That there were false teachers who got up and said, Thus says the Lord. And Jeremiah was like, No, 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 no. God doesn't contradict himself. He's already revealed this to us. This is something completely different. And, um, and so there's many who follow the evil example of their conduct. And it's, it's a, essentially proof that people would rather follow the false than the truth. They'd rather follow what feels good and what makes them feel good than what actually is needed uh, for holy living, for purity, for walking with the Lord. And we see that these false teachers are very successful in ministry. I mean, even enough to be asking for a private jet, right? They're obviously doing somewhat well. They've got glowing statistics to report. They've got crowds gathered to hear them. But statistics are not proof of authenticity. Uh, remember, the broad way leads towards destruction, and that's where these people are headed, right? The broad way is crowded, but it's the narrow way that few will find it. Those who are really are following Jesus Christ. And so many will claim to be true servants of Christ, but they're going to be rejected on the last day. Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You did all these things in my name, but we had no relationship. So we see that these are false teachers who are seeking to exploit people. And in verse 3, we get the motive. It's by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. They're seducing people by greed and charm. Uh, it tells us the motive really here is greed. Uh, these false teachers are interested in one thing, making money. 
They could care less about people. They'd rather use people to get what they want. Which is crazy. Real ministry is giving up everything that you want to help other people. It's laying down your life to serve other people. Saying, you know what, I'm going to put my needs and my wants aside from now, and I'm going to help this individual. False teachers say, I want you to put your needs and your wants aside and help me get what I want, which is money. And so we see that these false teachers are exploiting. They're making merchandise of ignorant people. They're using religion as a cloak of covetousness. Uh, They're trying to sound spiritual, but the reality is they don't have their own spiritual walk with the Lord. And if you think about it, our Lord Jesus was a poor man. He wasn't born in a prince, as a prince in a palace. He was born as the prince of peace in a lowly stable. Uh, his father was an earthly adoptive father. Joseph was a carpenter, right? He, he had a humble trade. Uh, Jesus came from a humble family. And you see, even the disciples who followed Jesus uh, were ordinary people, fishermen, <coughs> tax collector. I mean, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't rich and mighty. Um, and yet, for some reason, people want to follow their own example of Jesus, that we need to have all these riches. Um, but we know our true riches are in Christ Jesus. Everything we need is in Him. And so these false prophets are rich men who cleverly get others to minister to them. And they use charm to exploit people with deceptive words. Really what they do is they're, they're hoping and really preying on those who forget their past. They keep making new promises with guaranteed results. Oftentimes I found these are the individuals who come out with a new book. Buy my book on new ways to be healthy and prosperous and successful. And they are hoping people forget that their last book that promised the same thing, that people who read it, didn't have their life changed. (laughs) That, you know, yeah, it made this top selling list, but guess what? It didn't do anything, right? It didn't really help anyone. Yeah, sure, maybe there were a few people who helped just a little bit, but there was no spiritual transformation, right? Maybe they got them to go to a church, but that's about it, right? It It didn't really do anything else for them, except make this guy a lot of money off these book sales. And so they're hoping people forget Right, uh, And also by listening to their teachers, they're hoping people forget um, what they said last time. And so these false teachers use our vocabulary, but they have a different dictionary. They'll talk about salvation. They'll talk about grace. They'll talk about faith. They'll talk about spiritual things. But it's a completely different meaning to them. Right? Their idea of salvation is not our idea of salvation, which is through Christ alone. Theirs is, give me money, do good works, and, uh, and make a covenant with me, and I'll let God let you into heaven. Right? And so there's some really interesting things. And uh, the untaught believers hear these preachers, they read their books, and they think these men are sound on the faith. But they're not. And they're deceiving people. Um, and apparently there's a lot of people to be deceived because they're making merchandise off people who don't know their Bible. They don't know uh, what God's Word says. A true minister of Jesus Christ has nothing to hide. Their life is an open book. And their ministry is an open book. Uh, they don't um, run away from the truth of the Scripture. Right? They preach the truth in love. They don't twist the Scriptures to support their own selfish ideas. And they don't flatter the rich or only minister to those who will give them money. They minister to everyone. They have a heart for all of God's people. Um, and, and we want to make sure that that's our heart as well. I was interested uh, in looking a little bit more about people who are following uh, these kind of individuals. And I was reading an article recently about um, this cult that happened in Kansas City. And this person was writing an article and um, coming from a, a medical Uh, background and working with uh, some different religions and um, they wrote an article as I was googling signs you're in a cult 
And there was a lot of information on the internet, but here's some of the things that they had come up with. Uh, these are signs that you were in a cult. The first is that the pastor or leader is always right. Uh, they oppose critical thinking and they use manipulation. Um, I'll be the first to tell you I'm not always right. In fact, I can prove it. Ask my wife. <laughs> She'll tell you. Uh, she's pretty most of the time right. I want to say 99% of the time. Um, but you know what? That's why we need each other, right? We're a team together, right? We're here to help one another. And I find God's word is always right. <coughs> and you often hear me say, don't just believe me because I have the title pastor. Let the Bible be your final authority. Right? Let God's word instruct you. Because I may misquote something. I may say something wrong. And you're thinking, he got it wrong. But the only way you're going to know that is if you know the scriptures. Otherwise you say, oh, that was great. That was such a good message. I'm going to go look up second opinions tomorrow. And you're thinking, second opinions? That's not even the Bible. <laughs> but if you don't know the Bible, right? Um, and so I love being challenged on Scripture and, and talking it through. I love that we're critical thinkers. We come usually from a skeptic kind of viewpoint and thinking things through. That's good that we're critical thinkers. The second thing they say is that their exclusivism, that everyone else is wrong. They separate themselves from the Christian church at large and say that they're the true church. They're the right ones. And I love that as a local church, um, we have a heart for our community. You know, I network with the other pastors in town. We get together monthly and pray for one another. Uh, we do the, the community worship service uh, the first week in July. Um, we've got a, a local, here in our own fellowship, we've got a leadership team of men that... Uh, Hold me accountable and help uh, iron sharpen iron. And um, I also stay connected with local Calvary chapels nearby. We're part of the Calvary Chapel Association. So I've got a lot of relationships. And I an email server with pastors around the globe. And so it's always encouraging to hear how God's working in Australia and, and Africa and India. And you're thinking, oh, man, wow, this is amazing. God's at work everywhere. And so it's that relational aspect that we need. Um, the third thing they say is fear and intimidation with guilt and control. They begin to isolate members and penalize them uh, when they don't agree with them. And they'll say, well, that person is in sin or that person doesn't have enough faith. And they begin to kind of control people or use guilt and shame. Um, you know, here at Calvary Chapel, we have no official membership. You'll never get a letter from us saying you haven't attended for X, Y, Z amount of time. You'll never get a letter saying, we've noticed you haven't been giving. Apparently some churches do that. Um, we will never do that. People are free to come and go as they please. Um, and you've probably seen that, right? Uh, we tell them, hey, God bless you. We love you. We want you to find a church where you're going to grow. And hopefully they're teaching the Bible. Uh, and we'll be praying for you. We don't tell anyone that, oh, they left because they were in sin or didn't have enough faith. No. <laughs> but that false teachers and cults do that kind of thing. And we need to be aware of that. The fourth thing they say is they have no accountability for leadership. They claim that they alone know what God is wanting to do secretly. That God is channeling his secret plans through them alone. Uh, which is kind of creepy when you think about it. That... They have a, a special communication with God, and the rest of us don't. <laughs> um, the reality is we all have the Word of God, and uh, we all need the Word of God, right? We all are able to read His Word and be accountable to the Lord, right? We know what God's wanting to do publicly because of the Scriptures. And when we feel that God's moving in a direction... Um, I'll get together with our leadership team of guys and we'll pray. Um, we'll pray about it and, and seek the Lord's direction. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're following the Lord. Sometimes I don't know what the Lord's wanting to do, right? And that's where it's good to get counsel from others. And, and hear, what can we do? You know, how can we move forward? How can we best help each other grow in the Lord? Um, and so that's where the body's actually being the body. And that's a beautiful thing. The next thing they said was they demand the loyalty of followers. They seek affection and respect to be treated essentially as royalty, 
right? Kind of wanting that private jet, the new Mercedes Benz, the, the Lamborghini of you know all these cars and the big house. And um, again, Jesus didn't have any of that. In fact, there were many times he didn't have a home, right? He would just travel and wander and minister to people. He never asked for money. In fact, the only time he asked for money was the rich young ruler. And he didn't ask it for himself or for his disciples. He said, go and give it to the poor. These religious leaders often use those verses and say, you know, he called that man to give it all and and give it to the Lord. No, he didn't. He called it to give it to others. Not not to you so you can get your jet. Um, And so we'll never ask for money. I will never, I can promise you that I will never ask money for a private jet. <laughs> I don't even know what I'd do with one, to be honest. Um, you know, I just want to live a humble life. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we don't want to try and live a lavish lifestyle. Uh, we can't take it with us. You know, we, we need to remain humble and, and be servants of the Lord. The interesting thing, that the other thing they said here was that that cult leaders and the sign you're in a cult is that they encourage you to dishonor the family unit. They demand that they be the chief decision maker of your home. And if one of the family members disagrees with them, they're excommunicated. They're no longer welcomed. And, um, you know, that's really contradictory to the word of God. Uh, families are the backbone of our culture, uh, of the church. We want to strengthen families. We want to encourage families. We don't want to rip families apart. So we strongly believe in the family unit. We encourage families to pray together, make decisions together uh, in their own home. The less that I get to be involved in those decisions, the better. Um, I don't need to know everyone's decisions, (laughs) what's going on. Unless you want me to pray, I'll pray for you. But ultimately, I'm not making the decision for you. (laughs) Um, But these leaders, they they want to make those decisions they want to call the shots in your life and they want to control um and that's a sad thing the last thing that that they said that they do is they really emphasize special doctrines outside of scripture they claim to have spiritual insight as a prophet of god we don't have any special doctrines uh, except what's in the scripture Uh, i will never claim to be a special prophet of god um as a pastor, my mission is to simply teach the Bible simply, to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, um, do expository, systematic teaching of God's Word. I, I just really have found that's the best way to re- read and learn for myself. And oftentimes as churches, we encourage people to read through the Bible on their own. Why not teach through the Bible on Sunday mornings? And, you know, why not do that together? Um, I remember Haley's Bible Handbook. He encouraged pastors to do that. And, um, and that's my hope is that more pastors would do that. Simply teach through the Bible. To help people see um, what God's Word says. Again, these are some warning signs of a cult that's masked as a church. I'm sure there's more out there. Uh, but again, Peter's heart is that people would not be deceived. And if we were a cult, I probably wouldn't be telling you signs that you're in a cult, would I? <laughs> I <laughs> uh, probably wouldn't be doing that. Um, but we could, maybe we know of people who are in the, kind of those things. And maybe this would be a good message for them to listen to. Maybe this would be a good section of scripture for them to go and read on their own. To see who are they following. Are they following a person or are they really following Jesus Christ? Because that's who we want to follow. We want to follow him. Well, next, Peter will give us some examples of what happened to false teachers in the Old Testament, and some good examples of those who escaped, who the Lord had protected through those circumstances. The first one we'll see here in verse 4 and 5 is the example of Noah escaping the flood. And he says here in verses 4 and 5, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. 
Peter is using some examples to prove the point that judgment will come upon these false teachers. Judgment will come eventually to those who are led astray. And we see here that no matter how secure the sinner might feel, if they don't know Jesus Christ, there will be a day where they will have to be accountable for their sins, unless they surrender to Jesus Christ. And the first example he gives us here is of Noah. Uh, Genesis 6, 3 indicates that God waited 120 years before he sent the flood. Again, God is very patient. He's not willing to any perish, but all come to repentance. He waited a long time for people to come to him. And so after those 120 years, uh, eventually the flood came. But all during that time, Noah ministered as a herald of God's righteousness. He was pointing people to the true God. And if you want to read the description of the world before the flood, Romans 1.18 gives you kind of this depravity of man. In Romans 1.18 it talks about how the heart of man has grown cold and has gone after violence and selfishness and evil intents only. And essentially that's what God says. Uh, the civilization had become so corrupt it was necessary for him to wipe the earth clean, to have this new beginning with Noah and his family. So God saved only eight people, Noah and his family, because they had faith in God. Now what's fascinating, uh, coming from a Native American background with my mom's side, is there are over 300 Native American tribes that have a flood legend. In fact, there are even more cultures around the world that have a flood legend as well. And it's either there are usually six people or eight people. There's some Native American ones where they're floating on a, a flute or a log or the back of a turtle uh, or a boat, uh, like a canoe and all kinds of things. But the stories, you realize, there has to be truth, right? And the truth is God's word. That there was really a worldwide flood. It wasn't a localized thing. It was a global massive flood. And that God preserved Noah and his family. Now Jesus talked about Noah and his day. And if you compare our world with Noah's world, you see some really frightening parallels. Uh, as the days of Noah, so will it be when God returns, right? And we see that the true believers, Noah and his family, were a minority. No one really paid any attention to them. But the flood came, the entire population of the world was destroyed, and God indeed judged those who rejected his truth. Noah was a man of faith who experienced really a twofold deliverance. The first, we see that God delivered him from the polluted world around him, he preserved him and protected him. For 120 years, he was protected. As he proclaimed righteousness, this right standing with God by faith. He proclaimed the word of God to the people around him, and they wouldn't believe it. And you see, even when the ark was finished, he waited seven days before God closed the door. Noah was there with his family, ready on the ark for seven days, calling people, get on the boat, it's going to rain. You know, after the first day, ah, oh, it's not going to rain. Day two, oh, it's not going to rain. Finally, day seven, what's this stuff falling from the sky? Hey, let us in. And that's when the Lord closed the door, right? A little late at that point. And yet Noah had been faithfully preaching to them. Uh, there's one way to be saved. It's through this door. And Jesus would grab a hold of that and say, He is the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We have to come through Him. So Noah and his family were surrounded by these moral and spiritual darkness um, but they, their light kept shining. And, and God did not protect Noah and his family by isolating them from the world, but by enabling them to remain pure in the world that was uh, among them, corruption. And God will do the same with us. He protects us from the corruption of the world. And through Jesus Christ, we too have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So Noah was not only delivered physically, right, and delivered in the flood by this ark, but also spiritually, by the corruption of the world around him. The next example we get here in verses 6 through 8 is the example of Lot fleeing from Sodom. We see it says here in verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, 
marking them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Oftentimes when we think of Lot, we think of him seeing Sodom and Gomorrah, going to live near Sodom and Gomorrah, living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and then moving up into the city at the, the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we think... Usually that maybe he wasn't a, really that spiritual. Maybe he really wasn't as righteous. Um, and yet we're told through the scripture he was a righteous man. Um, doesn't mean he was perfect, right? Doesn't mean he was sinless. Um, but he had a love for the Lord. He had a faith in the Lord, uh, in God. And God enabled Lot and his family to remain unpolluted. Uh, even though they were living in the midst of iniquity. And God also rescued Lot and his two daughters before judgment fell on Sodom and the other cities of the plain in Genesis 19. Now again, Lot was not rescued on his part um, because he was doing anything special, but just because of his faith in the Lord, because he had a trust in the Lord. And so he was rescued because he was a believer. And also, I think, in a sense, because his uncle Abraham prayed for him. Uh, he had people who cared about him. We were interceding on his behalf. Lot's wife, however, um, didn't make it. Um, she was first exalted, and then she halted, and then finally she was salted. <laughs> um, she, she had this longing desire, and she looked back longingly, uh, for the city uh, and what it uh, had in there. And she turned into a pillar of salt, right? She was exalting herself in her mind, thinking, I know what's better for me than God. I don't need to listen. I can turn back and look. And then she halted. She stopped with her family. She stopped going in the direction. And then finally she was salted. Um, you know, she was essentially dead spiritually at that point. And she turned into a pillar of salt. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's the reality of what happened to her. Now, some people say that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their lack of hospitality. There's a big push uh, today for the, this mindset because of the homosexuality movement. That they try and say there's no evidence in any of the scriptures that God is against this. And they say that Sodom and Gomorrah was not destroyed for that, but simply for the lack of hospitality. That they did not show hospitality to these angels that came in, and that's why the city was destroyed. I don't think so. If you go back and read Genesis 18 and 19, you'll pretty much understand why. Um, they called the men to come out so they could know them. And it's the same word, know them, as Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived. Um, it was a perverse generation. It was a perversity that was going on. Uh, the record is given, again, in Genesis 18 and 19. And God's opinion of these people is found, uh, even in these local cities as well around. In Genesis 13, 13, it says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Peter says here that they were ungodly. And Jude, when we get there in Jude uh, verse 7, he says they were given to fornication and going after strange flesh. Scripture's pretty clear what's going on here. And here in verse 7 and 8, we see Peter tells us they practice filthy behavior and unlawful deeds. They were contrary to nature. Right? Romans chapter 1 talks about this in detail. Uh, the flagrant sin of Sodom and the other cities was unnatural sex, sodomy or homosexual behavior. And it's a sin that's clearly condemned in Scripture. 
Now, God has a heart for people, all people, regardless of what sin they commit. There's no one sin that's greater than another sin. Right? Lying is just as wicked as homosexuality. And so we need to make sure we're loving people, that we're having a heart to want to see them come to Christ and have that freedom in Christ, to be set free from the addictions, from the choices, from the bondage that's holding them down, from being free in Christ. We all need that, right? So our hearts should be broken and, and compassionate towards those who are making these choices, these lifestyles. And again, sometimes you hear people say, well, it's not a choice. I was born this way with this kind of a desire. I hear the same thing from those who are addicted to alcohol. Uh, coming from Native American, I hear, well, it's not my fault. I'm, I'm addicted. You know, I, I was conceived and I already had a, a strong desire for it. Well, I can tell you this. Your, your desire didn't force your hand to pick it up, the bottle, and force it to your mouth. Uh, that was your own desire, right? And maybe it's more of a genetic thing, but you know what? You are still in control of you, right? And so we each have those choices. We each have those decisions that we make. And so we, are, we need to make sure that we have that heart. And it's a reminder that God has reserved for the unjust a special punishment on the day of judgment. Uh, these false teachers may seem successful, right? Many follow them, but in the end, they will be condemned. God will finally do away with these people who are leading people astray, telling them, you don't need to repent for your sin. It's okay. God's okay with it. Just keep going the direction you're going. Um, God's going to deal sharply with those people and say, you're leading my, my people astray. In fact, Jesus said it's better for a millstone to be hung around their neck and thrown in the sea. That for one of his little ones to be led astray. So we see that that's what's going on here. Lastly, we'll see the example of the godly who are rescued today. Here in verses 9 through 11. And Peter says here in verse 9, Then the, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially to those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are in greater power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Again, we see here Peter's purpose was not to just denounce the false, but to also encourage us as believers. He once again reached back to the Old Testament. He cited the two examples, the deliverance of Noah and Lot. And he tells us in the same way God rescued them and kept them pure, God can rescue us and keep us pure in the polluted world around us to keep us from temptations and also from the judgment to come. In fact, we looked at this already in detail, uh, that we are not appointed to wrath. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we live or die, we should live together with Him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10, the Bible is saying that God will not send His wrath upon His people. The church is the bride of Christ. He will not bruise his bride. That does not mean that he will keep us from the wrath of man. Uh, we see that there are many atrocities in the world today. But we will be kept from the wrath of God. And that wrath is even worse. When we get to the book of Revelation by the end of this year, and, and we'll look at that even more in detail at the beginning of next year, we'll see that God's wrath is worse. We'll see that people are saying, Hide us from the face of the Lamb. Um, they'd rather hide than repent and receive that salvation. So, God's not going to send wrath on this world, I believe, until He takes His own special people, the church, out via the rapture. I believe that He will take us home to be with Him, and then, essentially, all of hell will break loose upon the earth. Uh, then those who have an agenda uh, to do destructive things will have an easier path to do it because there will be less Christians influencing 
and, and trying to seek to make the world a better place through Christ Jesus. We also see that submission to authority is something that they don't like. Uh, and submission to authority is a good hallmark for a Christian. Someone who's humble, someone who fears the Lord. A real Christian will rest in the glories of God. They'll keep their mind that there is an unseen world around us. There is a spiritual battle going on for the hearts and souls of people. Um, that We need to have that reality that this is not our eternal home. Our real home is in heaven forever with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know that even angels live in submission. And yet they don't speak against one another. And as Christians... We want to make sure that we don't speak evil of one another, right? That we encourage one another. We build each other up. And I believe a mature Christian will not slander or cut others down. They'll have a heart to want to build people up, to bring people to Christ, to build a bridge. Uh, I, will, I really don't believe a mature Christian will ever have a sign that will say, turn or burn, and, and point the finger at people and say, you're going to hell, without at least saying, but Christ took it on the cross for you, and He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to save you. Oftentimes, people who are doing those weird signs and stuff out there with, with condemning people, leave out the grace. They, they, they forget that Christ did all of that for us. He took the wrath for us. He took the punishment for us. So we can be forgiven. So we can become a child of God. And so... We need to make sure we're speaking the truth and love that we have God's heart. And, and that was Peter's, Peter's desire. Uh, God changed his heart. God changed his life. And God can do the same with us. We can have that heart of reconciliation. We can have that heart of wanting to see people come to the Lord. So in closing, the day is coming soon for Jesus to return. And for God to judge the world again, as in the days of Noah and Lot. My question for you would be, are you ready? Is there anything that you're holding on to the world that you'd say, I'm not ready to go to heaven right now. I'm not ready to be out of this world and be with Christ. If there's something that's holding you back from that, pray about it. Lord, help me. What is it that I need to let go of so I can just cling to you? Because I can tell you, if the rapture happened right now, all your problems are going to fade away. Because the best thing that could happen is being with our Lord Jesus forever. No more pain, no more death, no more fear, no more suffering, no more tears, no more bills. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good thing, right? Be with Him forever. And so we want to make sure we're ready. We, I want you to make sure you know Jesus, that you know He's the way, the truth, and the life. And that you know that you know that you know that He's your personal Savior. And your Lord. In just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. And if you don't know that you know that you know, I'm going to give you that opportunity. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the warnings in your word. That you tell us what to look out for. For those who would want to lead us astray. Those who want our wallet instead of our heart. Those who want... Uh, money from us instead of those who want to encourage our heart to follow you, to help us to be equipped to be a Christ follower. Thank you, Jesus, that you lived the perfect example of a humble life. You never asked money from anyone. You never really asked anything from anyone except to follow you, to lay down our life, to pick up our cross daily and follow you. And Lord, that's our heart's desire. It would be less of us and more of you. <coughs> so we ask that you would do that work in our lives. Help us truly to be about following you. And we pray, Lord, if there be any here among us this morning who have yet to make that decision, yet to say, I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I need to have that assurance that if I die today, I'd be with you forever in heaven, Lord. And if that's you and, and you're ready to make that decision, say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to say yes to Jesus, that you believe he died on the cross for your sins, was buried with your sins in that tomb and rose from the dead, and you're ready to receive forgiveness, a relationship with him, and everlasting life. 
And if you're ready to do that this morning, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins. That you come into my heart and to my life today. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for being my Savior and my Lord and my friend. And I pray that you'd empower me by your Spirit to follow you from this day forward. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.